Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you virtually to McMaster University and to the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. My name is Janice St. Denis and I'm a member of the broad team on campus that looks for ways to engage our alumni, faculty and staff through communications, activities and programs like this one. I'm pleased that you have joined us today. You know better than I that a lot goes into becoming a practicing physician. During those years, I imagine it can be easy to not focus on the distinctive financial planning demands of working as a physician. We're hoping to provide assistance with that today. Of course, when we get into issues involving financial and investment strategies, it makes sense to say right up front that McMaster is providing this session for background and information purposes only. We are not re recommending any specific approach, strategy, investment, or service. And now that our lawyers are satisfied with that disclaimer, I'm pleased to introduce the Dean and Vice President of the Faculty of Health Sciences and Dean of the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine, Dr. Paul O'Byrne. Dr. O'Byrne has been in those particular roles since 2016, after previously serving as chair of our Department of Medicine for a remarkable <clears throat> 14 years. So it's likely that many of you have crossed paths with him in one capacity or another. Dr. O'Byrne has been a part of the McMaster family since he started his residency in internal medicine and respirology here in 1977. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health, as well as a distinguished university professor at Mac. Here to provide a few words of welcome from the Faculty of Health Sciences is Dr. O'Byrne. Well, thank you very much, Janice. Very generous uh, introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to you all. As McMaster alumni, uh, to one degree or another, uh, you will all know the story of the founding of McMaster's Medical School. And indeed, I suspect many of you will be able to name the key figures and innovators and are uh, knowledgeable about the legacy of the work that they put into developing the school in the late 1960s. This is a legacy that uh, our alumni like yourself expand and enrich every single day. Very few people, however, would list Dr. K.J.R. Whiteman among the most important people in the development of McMaster Medicine. Yet in 1962, when Dr. Whiteman was chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto, he gave a talk which was attended by the then McMaster president, Dr. Harry Thode. At that talk, Whiteman suggested that medical training paid too little attention to the education in a broader, more humane sense. And Thode took that idea away with him, and half a, year, half a decade later, five years later, he, uh, working with John Evans, uh, supported the building of the foundation of a revolutionary medical school that has subsequently become the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine, which is, of course, your alma mater. Today, this medical school is no longer merely a disruptive upstart. We now lead from the front as one of the most accomplished and most successful medical schools in the world. McMaster most recently ranked in the top 20 medical schools in the world in the Times Higher Education uh, ranking. Now these rankings are a validation that the innovations that McMaster brought to medical education in the early 1960s, and indeed the many successful educational innovations since, together with the really immense research strengths we've developed have had real impact, as indeed have had the alumni of our medical school in so many different areas. As all of us progress in our careers as physicians, it becomes clear how truly well-rounded our skill sets need to be. Sometimes this uh, is obvious by design, uh, but other times without us even realizing it. We be start to become capable in fields like writing, public relations, law, administration, human resources, information technology, and indeed many other areas. I suspect that all of you here today as McMaster MD alumni have careers that are a little 
or a lot different from that you had expected or planned at the time of your graduation. And that is certainly true for myself. Inevitably, we also need to develop and exercise a certain degree of skill in financial management. And that's why, of course, we're all here today. As you know better than anybody, our profession comes with a particular set of financial complexities. And that's why we have built today's session around a couple of McMaster alumni who work in financial and wealth management, specifically with physicians. So as I thank all of you for participating in the webinar and staying connected to the Michael G. Groot School of Medicine, I also have the real pleasure of introducing our presenters, Ashley and Greg. Ashley Smith is a graduate of the DeGroote School of Business and a principal at Brownlow Partners Chartered Professional Accountants. Ashley is a CPA whose practice involves working with medical professional corporations on issues including compliance and tax planning. Greg Muldoon is also a graduate of the DeGroote School of Business. He is a certified financial planner and chartered investment manager a member of the Financial Planning Standards Council of Canada, and the president of Muldoon Wealth Services, which is aligned with Mandeville Private uh, Client Incorporated. Like Ashley, Greg devotes most of his professional attention to working with business owners and physicians. So I'd like to finish by, first of all, thanking all of you for attending today, and I'll turn the uh, presentation over to Greg. Well, thank you very much, Dr. O'Byrne. I really much appreciate the introduction. I'm very happy to be with you, all of you today. It's a, a, always a pleasure when we get a chance to speak to um, any uh, groups in, in the physician uh, area. So I um, uh, very much wanted to thank Dr. O'Byrne, Janice, Morgan, Eli, and all the rest of the alumni department for having us here today. And we're hopeful that we can share some ideas with you that at the very least we'll start uh, sparking some some interest in, in some ways that perhaps you can better yourself financially. So now I'm going to share my screen. And we will get into the presentation. Janice kind of alluded to a little bit of the uh, legal <laughs> jargon that we're intended to bring. Uh, the presentation today is going to be filled with some suggestions and ideas and strategies that uh, certainly can help a lot of you along the way financially, but it's very important to understand that both Ashley and I, whenever we uh, suggest any strategies such as the ones you're going to see today, uh, typically there's a lot of due diligence done in advance to fully understand somebody's situation. It's, these strategies and ideas should be con considered similar to that of tools, and as we all know, tools can be a great help in helping us uh, construct things, but at the same time, they can be dangerous if they're not used properly. So just keep that in mind when we go through these situations that if you do think it's something that, that appeals to you or perhaps find interest in, then I would suggest that um, you reach out to a financial service professional and have them take a look at your situation before deciding whether or not any of these ideas uh, are right for you. So I wanna cover a little bit of the agenda, what we're gonna talk about today. So many of you are uh, probably experienced with, with that of the corporation, but in an effort to lay some foundation, we wanna chat a little bit about the basics of what an, a corporation might mean for you uh, and your family. And in addition to that, we wanna try and paint a picture of the journey you're gonna go on uh, with respect to your uh, financial well-being. So we wanna talk a little bit about accumulating uh, your wealth, as well as then decumulating your wealth um, and try and give you some ideas and strategies that might help your particular situation. So now I'm going to pass the presentation over to Ashley, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about the basics of a uh, corporation. But before I do that, we, we have some poll questions that we wanted to try and engage the audience. Typically, when we do these talks, we're live. And so you know, in an effort to try and engage you all, uh, we have some poll questions. So perhaps if we could post the first poll question while Ashley is going to start with the, the basics, we can we can discuss that a little later in the uh, end of the presentation. So as Greg mentioned, the first thing that we're going to cover is a little bit of basics in terms of medical professional corporations or MPCs, as we refer to them throughout the presentation. 
For most physicians, the goal of the MPC is to defer tax and potentially reduce tax down the line. The MPC or corporation is a se separate legal entity from the shareholder. Any income that's left inside the corporation is taxed at a lower corporate tax rate compared to having this income tax personally at a top rate. So if you're not spending all of your professional income at home, then that money is retained inside the corporation. As those funds accumulate, one of the common strategies that we'll touch on is investing that inside the medical professional corporation through a variety of different strategies, which Greg will go into more detail on. All right, so based on the poll, this may help a few of you. So one of the common questions that I get as an accountant is, should I incorporate? When's the right time to incorporate? In a basic sense, if you're going to be retaining some of your cash or professional income inside the corporation and you don't need that all to pay um, personal expenses, mortgage, things like that, then it makes sense to retain some of that money inside a corporation and to incorporate. Some of the other uses for the cash inside the corporation may be paying down business debt, expanding operations. So if you're in a practice, you may want to purchase a facility, investing for retirement, which we'll touch on, and potentially paying life insurance premiums, which we'll also touch on. Um, there's also a little bit of room for income splitting. This has been reduced since some changes that the federal government brought in a couple of years ago. However, there are a couple of situations where this may be beneficial. If you are a two physician household and there's a discrepancy between the two income levels of those physicians, it may make sense to have one corporation and then split the income evenly to both shareholders through that corporation. There's also an opportunity to pay a salary to a lower income spouse. Most often we'll see this paid for administrative services that are performed. However, the salary must be reasonable based on the job duties in case CRA does review that. And there's also opportunity when you have large personal debt and uh, Greg will touch on that as well later in the presentation. One other sticky point that the federal government has put in a couple years ago is that they've changed the calculation for the small business limit. This is based on passive income or investment income exceeding 50,000. So we often get questions about, does it still make sense considering this reduction? And for the most part, it still does make sense based on your portfolio and if you have the right structure set up with your investment advisor, they can tailor your portfolio to minimize tax and hopefully not exceed the 50,000. If you do exceed the 50,000, it's not a huge deal. There's a little bit higher corporate tax rate paid. However, when you do draw that money out in the future, that money will be drawn out at a lower personal tax rate. So you're no further behind than if you only paid the lower personal tax rate. Thanks very much, Ashley. It was great coverage of the basics for corporations. Now we want to switch gears and start talking about accumulating assets within your corporation. Um, and as Ashley mentioned, there's a number of factors that are going to go into some of the decisions you make when it comes to the accumulation of your, of your assets within your portfolio. And the first area I'd like to, to start with is uh, talking about, you know, just very top level uh, investment planning strategies. And if we want to post a second poll question right now, this is going to give us an opportunity to have an understanding of how some of the investings that, that the audience members have done over the year, the, the uh, part of their uh, financial management. So while we're waiting for the results to tally, uh, I often get the question about, well, what, what's the right way to construct a portfolio? And obviously there's a number of factors based on your own personal situation that are gonna go into that. But ultimately there's, there's a concept and an idea of trying to structure a portfolio that mimics that of a large institution, like a pension fund, an endowment fund, uh, or ultra high net worth investor. Oftentimes when you look at this, the, the types of portfolios that exist for these types of investors, they generally tend to have a lot more a variety of investments in them that can certainly help the long-term um, long strategy when it comes to your investment planning. 
So essentially what we see typically for most individual investors like us is that they have some sort of collection of public fixed income or bonds, uh, public stocks, uh, and some form of cash or GICs. And, and depending on their risk profile, they'll uh, have some sort of uh, mixture of those uh, depending upon how much growth versus income they might need. But an institution and an ultra high net worth individual uh, endowment funds uh, generally tend to have several additional investments to them. They generally tend to include things like private equity, venture capital, private real estate, private debt, infrastructure and resources. And typically when I first start talking about an idea like this, I get a, a response that might sound something along the lines of, well, I'm, you know, I'm not an institution. I'm not sure I have the same needs uh, that an institution does. And I would uh, suggest that there's really only five needs that any investor could have, whether it be an institution or an individual. We all are striving to preserve our capital, have some level of liquidity, have some combination of income and growth. And in addition, as Ashley kind of alluded to, try to minimize taxes along the way. And so whether we are uh, an institution or whether an individual, typically th those five needs are very similar. And so when us as individuals really need to consider striving towards that of the way institutions uh, happen to manage their money as opposed to uh, you know, the traditional method for, for individuals. Um, you know, and a lot of times I'll also get a, a question about, well, isn't that too aggressive considering investing in some private investments? Well, then I would pose the question, do you consider the Canada pension plan or Omer's pension plan to be aggressive investment mandates? And if you don't, well then, uh, like I don't, then you can see here, and this dates back to 2016, and these this statistics have stayed pretty consistent since then. I mean, there's a slight variations, but you know, percentages here and there, but for the most part, it's very accurate. And as you can see, even Canada Pension Plan with its investment strategy has, you know, in and around 55 to 60% invested in private and alternative strategies. And the biggest reason for that is, Yes, there's some opportunity on the on the long term gain that you can look at, but more importantly, it really adds to the ability to, to diversify risk within your portfolio. And that's where I think a lot of people don't fully understand the value of, the, of why you'd want to include private and alternative investments in your portfolio. Biggest example I can give you is let's take a look at this year, right? If you were to own a, a, a standard stock, bond, and cash portfolio, uh, you'd have no area where your portfolio would be performing very well. Bonds have taken a, a very large dive this year, as have stocks. Um, however, if you had introduced some different private equity strategies, private debt, or even private real estates, those all three of those categories have a, have a high pr probability of being positive this year. And so what it ends up doing is providing what we call a lack of correlation. And that is the most important concept when it comes to diversifying risk in your portfolio, because some people think, well, to diversify, I should just have a bunch of different types of investments. And in actuality, you're going to hit a law of diminishing returns, where at, at one point, you're just going to keep adding different uh, companies or bonds or what have you, and you're just gonna end up chopping off more return than you are risk. And so as a result, the more important factor is find investments that don't necessarily move in unison with one another. Not to say that they can't ever be negative, but most importantly, they're just independent of one, one another with its return profile. And so um, that, that's what generally ends up diversifying risk is that you have assets that don't necessarily move in unison with one another. And as I'd mentioned previously, we might've thought stocks and bonds were lack of correlated, but as you can see with the existing economic uh, circumstances that we have today, uh, they're not necessarily that negatively correlated. So we're gonna move along. I, I, uh, if we could post the third poll question, I wanna, oh, we have an answer, okay, great. So as I kind of suspected most of the portfolios that exist out there happen to be more common and traditional. And this is where, again, we would try to educate um, our clients to understand the value and the importance of building a portfolio that looks a lot more like a pension fund uh, or a large endowment fund or an ultra high net worth investor. So if we could again, post the third question there, that's great. Yeah, I wanna have an idea of, of people's thoughts around the top marginal tax rate, personal income tax rate in Ontario. And I'll, I'll apologize to any of our non-Ontario residents on this. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the Ontario tax rates uh, when it comes to income taxes. 
However, you know, if you're from a different province, the amount of taxes that you're going to pay on your income is roughly close. So you can, these slides, although they don't necessarily are exact for your situation, if you're outside of Ontario, it'll be fairly close. So do we happen to have the results? Oh, here we go. So 29% think 14%. 53, uh, 57, uh, or, or sorry, 57% uh, think 53 and 29% think 48. Okay, good. So a lot of different answers on the board. Um, so the actual top personal income tax rate, both combined federal and provincial taxes in Ontario is 53.53%. And that starts in and around $220,000 of income. So as soon as you earn just over $220,000 of income, every dollar that you earn, 53 cents is going to go towards paying your tax bill. And this is a very big part of the reason why Ashley and I have clients, because ultimately what we're trying to do is figure out a way in which we can minimize the amount of taxes paid. We're not looking to avoid the tax. We just want to make sure our clients are paying their fair share. And this is where uh, the big differential comes in with respect to individuals that have the ability to incorporate. If you have active business income, net of expenses, before tax that comes in under $500,000, your tax rate on any retained earnings is only going to be 12.2%. Um, so when Ashley kind of reviewed the slide regarding, uh, you know, with all the changes that came in 2018 by the federal government to corporations and eliminating the, at least some degree of income splitting, uh, not, you know, clients that were looking to perhaps fund their children's education with the corporations, a lot of that has now since changed. But this is the fact that still makes it very valuable for you to be able to incorporate. Now, the timing of that, again, comes down to your particular situation. And I'm going to share a strategy with you a little later that might show that if you haven't incorporated yet, maybe you want to wait a minute before you do so. But in any event, if you are starting to accumulate assets within your corporation and you're under $500,000 of, of net income, that's deferring about forty one. dollars uh, just over 41% of income taxes. And this is what speaks to uh, the time value of money and compounding rates of return. And Albert Einstein said compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And you're going to see in a minute why, uh, why he, he, he made that quote and when we have a look at a little case study. This is a client that we worked with several years back, a physician who was looking 20 years out to retirement. Uh, they, they were thinking about incorporating their medical practice. They were earning about $450,000 before tax, had an RSP program, but more importantly, decided that uh, she had about $100,000 before tax to invest. And we basically looked at the difference between if she were to invest that personally after tax or invest that in her corporation. So if, if, we, if we take a look at the two scenarios, if she were to invest that money after she had paid her personal tax, out of that 100,000, she would only have been left with just over 46,000. However, if she were to invest in her corporation, she'd only be paying that 12.2% corporate tax rate, leaving her with almost double, $87,800 to invest. And again, the, the idea of compounding returns really speaks to the idea that the, the faster you can get larger lump sums working for you, the faster you're going to get that, that critical mass or faster you're going to get that snowball effect. So when we, when we take a look at that data as, as we extrapolate it out, and again, we used fairly conservative returns in this projection in terms of it was a 7% rate of return on average year over year while Marion was working and then 6% in her retirement. And the reality is, regardless of the return, as long as we're assuming that either portfolio would be invested the same, because there really be no reason why you wouldn't invest your your portfolio similarly personally versus your corporation, um, the rates of return will be relative. And, and certainly you could consider them being the same in either case. But as you can see here, by the time she hits retirement, she almost has double the amount of money sitting in her corporation as she would personally. She'd be at 3.851 million versus just over $2 million personally. So that extrapolates out to an income stream for the next 30 years in case of her corporation of $264,000 versus 140. So again, almost double the amount of money over her uh, accumulation phase and her decumulation phase. And, and again, this just really speaks to how if we can magnify the ability, uh, the, the, uh, if we can, we can magnify the returns by having more money to work with up front. And that really is the value of that tax deferral 
of your corporation. Yes, you're going to eventually have to pay tax on some of that money, but ultimately, uh, it certainly allows you to grow a much larger amount of money uh, up into your retirement years. So we asked the question earlier in the presentation about how many people had incorporated yet versus how many hadn't. And it was nice to see that a couple hadn't because that makes this strategy a little bit more impactful. This is typically a strategy that we would use with unincorporated clients. And so for those of you who are incorporated, I would suggest that uh, it's, it's not completely uh, something you shouldn't hear because perhaps you have a spouse that's just entering into their medical practice or you have a, a child that might be entering into, the, in, into a medical practice or perhaps you work with some younger physicians. And this strategy can be very, uh, very helpful for their particular situation. It's really a strategy of efficiency, right? Understanding how you can utilize the tax rules within uh, our country to ultimately uh, make your situation more efficient. And, and really the, the nature of this strategy is, is you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take any of your personal debt that we would call non-deductible debt, right? Most of us already realize that you can't deduct the interest on your mortgage, you can't deduct the interest on perhaps a, a student line of credit that you took out while you were going to med school. However, what you can do is if you have a, a debt that is attached to a business, and, a, and in particular, a business's ability to make money, the interest that you pay on that is tax deductible. And so the idea here is we're trying to take any personal non-deductible debt and turn it into business debt that is deductible. So typically, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at what we see in, in terms of a typical scenario, right? Let, let's assume a business or, or a practice that's generating four, $400,000 before income taxes. And then they have $225,000 of annual expenses. So that 400,000 works out to being roughly $34,000 a month. And, and of that $34,000 a month, they need $19,000 to, to service their business expenses. Perhaps it's rent on a building, Maybe it's uh, salaries of employees. So typically where we see this most commonly, general practitioners, dentists, anyone who's part of a grouped, uh, a grouped uh, medical practice where there's a bunch of different dif disciplines and you share the space and you probably share some employees and infrastructure, this becomes a common scenario here. And so if the situation looked like this, you, you pay your 19,000 of your 34 two or your expenses, which leaves you with $15,000 a month to pay your taxes personally, and then have money left over to pay your personal expenses. Oftentimes we see with medical professionals that they might have a personal mortgage, or perhaps they have a student line of credit. And so from their net income, they're needing to service all that debt. Now it's important to note that a cash damage strategy doesn't necessarily uh, eliminate your debt. Um, it's designed to, to, to move your debt into a more favorable area so that you then can pay it down much more quickly. So in this case, the numbers kind of worked out where uh, essentially what we would do is instead of funding that $19,000 a month out of our cash flow, we would use a line of credit or an all-in-one type of account for our business to then fund the uh, payment of our business expenses month over month. Well, what that does is it frees up that $19,000 to then be reutilized on the pay down of our personal debt because we still have the, the expenses. So really it's that $19,000 a month of free cash flow that allows us to rapidly pay down our debt. And in this case, it would do it over the course of a year. And then basically what we're left with at the end of the day is now we've gotten rid of all of our personal debt that's non-deductible to us. And we're left with business debt that is deductible, at least the interest is deductible. And so that, that way we can, we can, pay down that debt, and also get some tax advantages from the interest that we have to pay. So again, it doesn't necessarily pay it down more rapidly in the beginning, but allow you to accelerate it by the idea that you'll, you'll be able to be more efficient with the repayment of your debt and, and being able to deduct a portion of that, uh, of that interest. So now I'm going to pass it back over to Ashley, who's going to start talking a little bit about decumulating. So now that you've accumulated everything and all your investments inside your corporation, the next common question that I receive is, I'm about to retire, now what happens? So once you are preparing to retire or you're in the end stages of getting ready for that, you're going to work with your lawyer to file articles of amendment. And what this will do is change the name of your corporation to remove the medical professional corporation section of your corporate name. And you'll likely default back to the number company that was assigned when you incorporated. 
The corporation continues and will hold your investment portfolio, life insurance, real estate, anything else that's inside your corporation. However, it continues. It doesn't end when you retire. Now we can pull the funds out of the investments and the MPC at much lower personal tax rates. One thing to note is this assumes that you're going to be at a lower kind of cash need at home because you're likely paid off your mortgage and, and have other opportunities there. It also provides some flexibility. So there's no minimum withdrawal requirement as opposed to an RRSP that's converted into a RIF. There's a minimum requirement each year on what has to come into income and be taxed personally. So this strategy by using your corporation allows us to plan around other sources of income, potentially splitting with a spouse once you, the physician is 65, and there's a lot more flexibility on slowly drawing that out in tax efficient means. Great, thanks Ashley. The one thing I'll say about this portion of the presentation is this generally tends to be a lot more tailored to a individual uh, client situation, right? So to try and give you an actual generalistic strategy of decumulating your assets, that becomes very difficult to do in a presentation like this, simply because a lot of work has to go into exactly what goes on with your family dynamics, time horizon, long-term estate planning wishes. And so a lot of these questions become very, or a lot of these situations become very tailored to clients' particular situation. But with that said, ultimately what we, what we want to try and do is as we're accumulating within our assets, the idea is, first of all, first and foremost, is build the strategy around the client's family dynamics, their risk profile, their, their time horizons, their goals and their needs. Uh, but then also take into consideration, how can we do this as tax efficiently as possible? while we accumulate, but with the understanding that we also wanna maintain a level of tax efficiency when it's time to decumulate. And so looking for products and, and, and uh, investment uh, options that will allow for us to have some flexibility when it comes to, again, accumulating and then transitioning into the decumulation strategy. So I, I will share a, a strategy that we've used uh, several times with, with a bunch of our uh, incorporated clients that allows them to, again, accumulate and decumulate a, a, a pool, a, a pile of their assets um, by using a, a, a life insurance vehicle. So before I continue, can we post the last poll question um, just to get a sense as to how long some of our audience members have been practicing? Not that this necessarily matters a lot, but it certainly will give us an idea of where does this kind of fit in the overall audience's uh, planning situation. There's a number of different ways in which you can implement this strategy. I've seen situations where it makes sense to, to implement it a little bit earlier in, uh, in a physician's practicing. Um, and then I've also seen situations where it comes, okay, so it looks like we've got a pretty even mix across the board, which is great. And, and I would say to you that there's really, if this strategy isn't something that's been introduced to you before, it's certainly something whereby uh, it probably fits in all three of these categories. And, and at worst case, that maybe the earlier practicing physicians um, will start to see where this might fit in several years down the road. But essentially, uh, what a lot of people may or may not know is that life insurance can actually be used, certain types of what we call permanent life insurance can be used as asset accumulation vehicles, right? And most of the time people hear insurance, they think, oh, I need it to, to have just in case something happens to me before I've accumulated a lot of my assets and I need to pay off my, my debts or, or take care of my, my surviving spouse and or children. But realistically speaking, it's an incredibly efficient uh, vehicle for accumulating assets as well as, as well as decumulating assets. So in this case, we would treat this as more of a, of a, of a way in which we're gonna fund uh, a, a collection of assets within the structure of the policy. And that allows us a lot of the, the tax efficiencies that come with insurance. And in the case of a corporately owned insurance policy, essentially, you know, in this visual, you're seeing, okay, you, you as the shareholder will own the corporation. We assign ownership of the life insurance policy to the corporation as well as the beneficiary. And then we're also able to fund that insurance policy with our after-tax corporate dollars as opposed to our personal dollars. So again, we're in a situation as we spoke on before, where we have that ability to put much more money to work for us before there's some substantial personal taxes that are being paid. And then the next step, so, so basically we spend our time uh, while we're working, uh, you know, adding to our, you know, our standard investment portfolio and perhaps adding to 
the life insurance silo, right? I, again, also an excellent diversification tool because the way that some of these policies can work happen to have a low correlation to more standard-based investments, especially if we're talking about whole life life insurance. And so essentially, like I said, what's going to happen is you're going to accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And over time, you're going to have a, a sizable sum of money uh, inside the insurance policy, no differently than you would have your more standard investment portfolio. And so in the ideal world, this is probably the most effective uh, tax strategy when it comes to wealth transfer. So first and foremost, if there is a desire or a need for wealth transfer, whatever that wealth transfer is to beneficiaries, to charities, to institutions, whatever that is, um, very tax efficient to have this money flow from your corporation out to those, to those particular people. Um, but further to that is, is, you know, the idea that you can actually access the capital within these life insurance policies while you're still alive. There's a number of ways to do it. I would suggest the most uh, efficient way to do it is you can go to a bank and, and there's a lot out there that, that will, will accept a life insurance policy as collateral, BMO being one of the top because they have a, an insurance arm. May Life's bank has, has a lot of experience with this. But in any event, there's a number of banks out there that, that are more than willing to offer you a loan uh, as, uh, with your life insurance policy as collateral, right? And typically what you'll see happen is, let's say, for example, over the time that you've had this policy, you've accumulated $5 million up until the point when you want to start drawing on it, and you go to the bank and they'll give you a percentage of that um, value and allow you to take it in the form of a loan line of credit, whatever makes sense. Sometimes people would like to access a lump sum of money straight away and it's a fairly tax efficient way to do it. Uh, we, we've used a strategy in the case of a client looking to actually want to have a, buy a cottage in retirement and, you know, as opposed to drawing a big lump sum out of their corporation and, and pay a, a bunch of taxes that way, it made more sense to kind of take periodic withdrawals from the insurance policy to then pay down the mortgage uh, over time. Uh, but in any event, whatever the situation might be, you, you're able to draw from a loan that then pays out to you by way of dividend as the uh, as the shareholder. But again, back to my example, if you had say 5 million uh, accumulating uh, within that policy uh, and then you pledge that as collateral, the other reason why banks love this strategy is because they realize that the nature of these policies are to continue to grow. And so they, they, they might give you the opportunity to what we call uh, capitalize the interest being that they're not even gonna ask you for an interest payment um, because they know that your policy is going to continue to grow. And so whenever it's time for you to pass and, and now everything is being settled, uh, essentially, they realize that they should get their money back. And in this instance, you know, you, you have a situation where it was originally worth about five uh, million dollars when you were starting to draw on it. And then uh, as you, uh, you perhaps you, your, your loan balance got up to about five, uh, sorry, four million dollars by the time you passed but the policy was growing that entire time, right? Again, these types of policies, just like your investments can attain that level of critical mass and that snowball effect. And certainly if you just use a loan as opposed to accessing some of the capital in that policy, it should grow quite rapidly towards the tail end of its existence. And so it might be worth $10 million by the time it's time to pay out and pay off the loan. And so that's exactly what happens when you do pass the first payoff goes to the bank to get rid of that loan. So in this example of it being worth uh, $10 million and their $4 million loan repayment, that $4 million comes off right away. And then the remaining $6 million is paid through to the corporation. Now here's where the part gets even more attractive for most people. And that is what an insurance policy has the capability of doing is building up what we call the capital dividend account. And Ashley uh, certainly has a lot of experience speaking to clients about this particular account because really what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a notional account. So it's not a physical account with money in it. It's, a, it's basically a number that can grow over time with various inputs from your, your existence within your corporation, life insurance uh, being one of them, that essentially means you can get money out of the corporation tax-free. And so depending on when you uh, set this, this strategy up, it's very possible that you'll pay very little tax on the, on the remaining death benefit flowing through the corporation to your beneficiaries or to your estate. Um, but there are certain circumstances where if you had it in place long enough, you'll actually have a large enough capital dividend account that allows the proceeds to flow completely tax-free. And that's the example I'll share with the, the example I'll share with you here. We had a situation several years back 
but we had a, 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 a client where they wanted to fund a 20 pay permanent insurance policy. It was, it worked out to being $30,000 per year. And again, it's, it's important to know that think of this more as, as part of your investment strategy, as opposed to insurance. Cause obviously for some of you that have used to term insurance, that probably seems like a lot, but only a small part of that 30,000 would be going to fund the insurance. Whereas the remaining portion will be there to grow the, 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 what we call the cash value of the policy. So in this instance, that $30,000 per year for 20 years bought them an initial policy of $550,000, which basically meant if something happened to uh, the, the, this particular client in year one, they would have paid the $30,000 and it would have paid out 550. But if it continued to fund over time, uh, it, would have, it'll, it would have grown quite substantially in value. Now, at the time we implemented this strategy, I think we were, were looking at the borrowing from the bank at about 7%, which in, up until this year was quite high. But based on what's gone on for the remainder of this year, it's actually probably fairly accurate as the number you'd be looking at to borrow against the policy now. And in this instance, we were looking to have the policy pay out from 67 to 83. Assuming we were paying, it, uh, had to pay the dividend tax rate to get the money out, this provided the client with 58,000, just over $58,000 of income after tax. So that's net in your pocket for 17 years, that totaling just under 990,000. And that would leave you, in addition to that, once this was all settled and wound up at the end, there was still a residual insurance value of just over $1.4 million. And in addition, we had been able to build up a capital dividend account credit to 3.48 million, which meant that entire residual amount of insurance came out to the beneficiaries tax-free. And if we were to compare that to say a more traditional income bearing, uh, interest bearing investments, which generally tends to be taxed at a heavier, heavier rate, that same $30,000 a year for 20 years would only be able to provide an after-tax income of about 50, of, of that just over 58,000 uh, up into age 82. So one less year. And in addition to that, there was no residual estate value and no increase to the capital dividend account. So that 3.48 capital dividend account credit that we saw on the previous screen, uh, we could use a portion of that for the insurance proceeds, but then there's also uh, the remainder amount that can be used to help get additional assets out of the corporation with paying little to no tax. So now we're gonna kind of get to the last little bit of the uh, presentation. And this is where we talk about wealth transition, right? Um, hopefully, Ashley and I, or your advisor and account, have done a really good job for you over the course of your life. And, and now we're starting to talk about what happens to the assets over and above what we need during our lifetime. And I get, a, as Ashley, we get a variety of different answers on that on, on here. And obviously, our goal is to try and help them realize uh, uh, exactly uh, what they're looking for in the most tax efficient manner possible. You know, and, and by way of using insurance policies or a variety of different investment op uh, options, you know, oftentimes we come across a situation where there might be more money than clients uh, expected there to be. And as a result, uh, have, have made comments such as, well, I'm not sure I want to leave all of this money to my beneficiaries or, or, or my kids. And, um, you know, and obviously there's a bunch of different options, right, in terms of you could leave it to your family members. You could leave it to uh, you could you, perhaps there's a charity that you're closely affiliated with that you really that's meaningful to you. I mean, there's a bunch of different options. The one common denominator that I get is, as I said, if we don't do anything and we don't try and plan for the most efficient transfer of your wealth, the only person who's going to benefit the most is the CRA. They will end up being your number one beneficiary if you don't have a proper estate plan in place. And that's generally what gets people motivated to to uh, ensure that, that the way they structure their, their wealth transition uh, it aligns with at least areas that resonate more with them. Again, it doesn't have to necessarily be beneficiaries. It could be some form of charitable giving uh, or getting into research, whatever it is that, that you might be passionate about. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Ashley, who's gonna finish up on a few, um, on a few uh, options when it comes to actual uh, corporate donation planning. Thanks, Greg. So as Greg mentioned, we'll go through a couple of scenarios and they each build on each other. So the first scenario is a basic donation. So the MPC is going to donate $100,000 of cash. So in this case, for any income under $500,000, you're going to save about twelve point two um, in terms of tax savings. If you have income over five hundred thousand, you're going to save about twenty six thousand in terms of tax savings on that donation. 
So the next scenario, you're still going to donate $100,000 of cash. However, based on points earlier in the presentation, most NPCs don't keep a lot of cash on hand and it's held within an investment portfolio. So in order to liquidate that cash, you have to sell some shares. The shares have an inherent gain of $50,000. So in this case, the actual donation of 100,000 has the same tax savings as scenario one. However, you know, now have to pay corporate tax on that capital gain by selling the shares. And that corporate tax is about $5,000. If we move to scenario three, we're gonna use the same numbers. However, this time the MPC is going to donate $100,000 worth of value of publicly traded shares. So here we're not actually donating cash, we're donating shares. Again, the shares have the same gain of 50,000. The actual donation, again, the 100,000, still has the same tax savings. However, the capital gain that's triggered on the donation of the publicly traded shares is subject to a 0% capital gains inclusion rate. This is compared to a 50% inclusion rate that you would normally have on any sort of capital gains inside the corporation. So in this case, you're actually saving $5,000 on that inherent gain by actually donating the shares and not liquidating them into cash first. So the long and the short of these scenarios would be if you're considering, considering donating, you want to look for publicly traded shares that have those larger inherent gains. And this may be pretty easy if you've been accumulating your wealth over a long period of time. There may be some shares that have a pretty significant inherent gain that you can eliminate that tax liability on. It's not a deferral. Here, we're actually saving the tax on that capital gain, which is a nice advantage. That's great. Thanks very much, Ashley. So that wraps up the formal part of the presentation. Hopefully, uh, everybody in attendance was able to find some value in what Ashley and I were able to cover today. Uh, we want to thank you for your time. It was a great pleasure to be able to share some ideas and strategies with you. Again, if you ever have any questions uh, that perhaps you will certainly will take some questions right now. If you have any questions uh, that you perhaps feel more comfortable taking offline, here's the contact information for Ashley or I. We'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you do have. Certainly, uh, if, you've, if there's some things that you did find of value today, by all means, reach out to a financial professional, whoever that might be, to help them uh, see if it makes sense for your situation. But now I'll, I'll turn it back over to Janice, who I think will, will help offer some questions from the group. Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much, Greg and Ashley. Um, we do have a, a small amount of time for some questions and we do have, uh, if you have those questions, feel free to feed those in um, using, I believe the Q&A portion of the webinar uh, and I will get them fed to me here to ask. So our first question is, I'm still paying my student loans four to five years out while practicing. What should I focus on, investing or paying down personal debt? Or is there another option? Great question. Uh, I would say, and, and, and Ashley, I'd be curious to get your, your take on this as well. I think the trade-off always comes in these scenarios is, is taxes versus, um, you know, taxes versus interest rate, right? And so depending upon the situation you find yourself in, as you saw earlier in the presentation, certainly if you're not incorporated, I'd be looking at seeing whether or not a cash jamming type strategy worked in your particular case. But if you are incorporated, the challenge of paying off that debt, at least accelerating that debt, is you know depending on which province you're in, you're roughly going to be in a situation where you're going to have to pay roughly 40-ish percent uh, on top of uh, your business tax to get that money into your hands personally to be able to pay down that debt. And so you got to kind of compare that to the interest rate that you're paying down. And I mean, I know interest rates are on the rise and I would imagine most uh, lines of credit for physicians generally tend to be variable, but you know, maybe you have a fix. If so, that's, that's even better for you right now. But even in the case of a variable, uh, variable interest rate, we'll probably see interest rates rise for the next little bit and maybe stay there. But, you know, the answer to higher interest rates generally uh, generally tend to be, a, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's only so long that the interest rates can remain high and eventually they'll have to start coming down again because of the way it'll slow down the economy. And so what I would suggest to you is that if you're worried about interest rates going up, just keep in mind the idea that if you were to try and focus on paying down your debt, 
uh, you're going to be paying a lot more in income tax for the flow additional monies outside of your corporation in order to pay it down. And so I think the math would support the idea of trying to accumulate assets. And, and you know, the one term I always use when it comes to clients, because I know and I've seen a number of cases where uh, debt is a very emotional thing for people and it's totally understandable. But I would say if you accumulate assets, the one thing that gives you is what we call collateral clout, meaning you have the ability to pay down your debt at times in the future by accumulating more monies. As we saw how much you can accumulate in advance, if you were to just keep that money in your corporation, I would say that there is some sort of uh, advantage if you were to stay that route. But with that being said, generally, Ashley and I sit down with our clients and we look for ways that we can try and do both. But ultimately, the numbers do generally tend to favor the savings over, over rapidly paying down debt. Anything to add to that, Ashley? I think you hit on the, the, the main points. I think it's always finding that balance between not just investing and not paying down debt or just paying down debt and not investing. It's just finding the balance between those two and what works for you. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and the one thing I would add to that is a lot of times what we want to look at is how much, if you are incorporated, how much are you drawing from the corp? Because we've seen, I've seen clients where they're able to get by on a very modest amount of income flowing from the corp and they look at it like, oh, I can save that much more money by keeping it in it. But the reality is, is that we don't want to give up certain lower tax rates. So there is, a, there is an argument to me that you want to be taking out at least a certain amount of income from your corporation, because if you don't, you're going to build this big pool within the corporation and eventually it's going to have to come out. And when it does, it's going to get taxed at those, a lot of it, at those higher tax rates, in which case you're going to want to ensure that you know, as you're going along, you're going to want to maybe draw a little bit more if you're at a low level and, and that's perfect money to be used to pay down debt or maybe even invest personally. Excellent. Thank you both. Our second question, I'm 10 years into my career and wondering what you would recommend for bolstering my finances for retirement. Am I starting to think about this too late? Uh, another great question. Uh, you know, oftentimes I get, so I'll, I'll relate this to another scenario that maybe you found yourself in um, because it, I feel like it's the age old question. Should we pay down our mortgage or should we invest our money? Right. And that's oftentimes where people find themselves if they're just starting to get started later. And, and all I say to people when, when this comes up, because again, acknowledging that sometimes mortgages and debts are really uh, causing people lack of sleep at night factor. And there's, there's the, that, uh, that emotional side of it that causes a lot of discomfort. And so I never want to discount that when it comes to the planning ideas for clients. But what I would say is it, the, the trade-off is simply this. If you were to focus on paying down your mortgage aggressively early on, and then waiting a little bit longer to start saving for retirement, the reality is, is that that can still work out for you. It just means you need to save a little bit higher percentage of your overall income. And so it's definitely not too late to, to start building your retirement nest egg. It's hard to say without understanding, you know, when you're hopeful to retire. I mean, I know a lot of physicians that some of them are willing to work as long as their health will allow them to, in which case, yeah, you've got a good amount of time to continue to accumulate. If importance, if the importance of retirement is, is much more in the forefront for you, well, then you know, I would, I would suggest that really you need an advisor to sit down and look at your overall situation and then create an, an accumulation plan that's going to show you, okay, if you save this much, this is what you can expect. If you save this much, this is what you can expect. Uh, and at least give yourself an idea of whether that fits with what your vision of what retirement looked like. Ashley, anything to add? No, you hit that one on the head. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, for question three, uh, it's an interesting one. When should I start thinking about decumulation? Do I need to start this process six months out from retirement, a year? Is there a perfect timeline that you can tell us? That's great. Uh, good question. And I'm sure <laughs> Ashley and I can also give two perspectives on this question, right? Because there's obviously going to be a tax side of it. And then there's the, the whole, uh, you know, will I outlast my money kind of side of it, which is more of my domain. And, and the first thing I always say to clients when we start getting closer to retirement is five years is a pretty, is a pretty valuable uh, spot. And, um, you know, granted, we can move that depending on situation. But as far as a general rule goes, I say five years out you want to have your strategy, you really should have your strategy in place for what, how you're going to do it. And the reason why I say five years is because if we kind of look through market history over the last 100 years, 
five years is a good amount of time that allows you to adapt to the market situations that are at hand. And here's the reality, like any, even the greatest advisors in the world are not going to be able to predict what the market is going to do. It's just not going to happen. I mean, Warren Buffett would tell you that he can't do it. So if he can't do it, I wouldn't, I would suggest most advisors can't. So if, if we can't predict what the market is going to do, well, then we need to have a plan to be able to understand the fact that that volatility that's going to happen, we need to be able to be prepared for it in any direction, right? And, and really the biggest risk to you outliving your money kind of happens in those couple years right into uh, going into retirement and a couple years when you're first in retirement. Because when you look at uh, decumulation strategies, if you were to have, if you wanted to de decumulate at a certain level each year in retirement, but then within the first couple of years going into retirement or the first couple of years into retirement, you had a dramatic drawdown or a market turn down on your portfolio. When we look at different, what we call Monte Carlo analysis, which basically when we look at decumulation, we want to see variable rates of return as opposed to linear rates of return, because that's kind of more how the market works. We see that you could have the exact same long-term rate of return, say 6%. And if you were to get market downturns in the first couple of years versus the later years, you have a much more higher probability of running out of your money. And so that's where that five-year time horizon comes in because essentially what it allows you to do is you can, if markets have been doing great up until that point, it's a really good time to really try and look at structuring your portfolio in a way that we start to set aside monies that for those first couple of years of retirement, should we see that significant downturn? And furthermore, if if it's if it's if the markets have been have, have just gone through a downturn, we've got five years for them to rebound before we need to start drawing on it. And so it allows us to kind of play the waiting game a little bit. Like even if you look at the financial crisis in two, 2008, which was one of the worst market downturns in history, five years later, most people were back to where they started, if not slightly slightly above. So uh, sorry to ramble on you, Ashley. I don't know if you want to take any approach from a tax perspective to that. Yeah, so for a tax perspective on decumulation, we typically look at that pretty early on in, in an incorporation. As Greg mentioned, there are some physicians that will say, well, I only need about $80,000 of cash every year. Well, that means you're accumulating a lot. And when you go to retire, you may have more than we can declare over the next 20 years to draw out of that corporation. You're going to pay higher tax in retirement than you do when you're working. So one of the goals that we like to do is kind of use up those lower tax brackets by declaring a dividend. And even if you don't need the cash, you can create a shareholder loan that you can take out tax-free at a later date, which becomes beneficial if you want to buy a cottage later or you just want to retire later, whatever the case is. But that money comes out tax-free. So you're prepaying tax at lower rates. And that allows us to kind of keep the value of the corporation in line to where we want it to be. So rather than getting into, I'm retiring tomorrow and I have $5 million of assets, that's a lot to dry out over the next 20, 30 years. Um, so always having those conversations early on is helpful. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. I'm mindful of the time and uh, want to just say thank you once again to Greg and Ashley. And thank you to all of you for your questions and your participation and your ongoing connection to McMaster and the Michael G. DeGroot School of Medicine. As I mentioned at the start, this is a new kind of program for us, but something we're certainly looking to um, grow and expand in the future. We want to give you and your fellow alumni a variety of options. So please keep your eyes on your email for additional information uh, on our upcoming activities. And we look forward to your feedback on this session as well. And with that, I will wrap up today's webinar with a final thank you to Greg and Ashley and Dr. O'Byrne for their time to to today uh, and to you for being a part of this event. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much for having us.